Praise be to God who guided us to this, and we would not have been guided had not Allah guided us. وما توفيقي ولا اعتصامي ولا ثقتي إلا بالله وما توكلي ولا اعتمادي إلا على الله Our success is only by God. We grasp on only to God. And we have confidence only in God. In God we trust and upon God we rely. Alhamdulillahi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'hdihi wa nasta'ghfiruhu ونعوذ بالله من شرور نفوسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا Praise be to Allah We seek his help We seek his guidance We seek his forgiveness We take refuge with God from the evils of ourselves and our misdeeds Those whom Allah guides cannot be misguided and those whom Allah misguides shall, not, shall never find a friend to guide them. We testify that there is no God but Allah, alone and without partner. And we testify that our Master and Prophet Muhammad is a slave and messenger. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala hadha nabi al kareem May Allah send prayers and peace and blessings upon that noble messenger, that kind-hearted man sent as a mercy to the world. Allah tells us in the Quran, describing the true believers, when they get angry, they forgive. And one of the greatest character traits of the Muslim, and really of every person, but particularly of the Muslim, and most importantly for the Muslim, is that we should be striving for this idea of futuwa, a word that might be best translated as virtue. And so Imam al-Hassan tells us what this virtue, what this futuwa is. He tells us that the very verses that we end every khutbah with, that is what futuwa is. Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan. That indeed Allah commands to justice and to excellence. That is futuwa. To actualize that in your life is to, to, is to become a fata, a person of virtue. But of course that is very vague. Justice and excellence, right? So we want to understand what that is a little better. And so our scholars explain a little further. And they say that futuwa is when a crime is committed against you, when a wrong is committed against you, then you forgive and you forgive quickly. And you offer excuses for the person that wronged you. That is futuwa. And this is why Allah describes the believers as وَإِذَا مَا غَضِبُوهُمْ يَغْفِرُونَ When they get angry, they forgive. But not only that, we go beyond just that. If we look at the story of Sayyidina Yusuf السلام, who is considered the paragon of futuwa, the greatest example of futuwa alongside Sayyidina Ali, look at what he did. When th that day when he met his brothers, again, after they had abandoned him, after they had betrayed him, he said, لا تثريب عليكم اليوم يغفر الله لكم There's no blame upon you today. There's nothing at all against you today. May Allah forgive you. And he, he didn't just forgive, but he gave an excuse for them. He described the event, he described what happened to his brothers, why they did what they did, by saying, مِن بعد نزغ الشيطان بيني وبين إخوتي After shaitan instigated the separation between me and my brothers. He put the blame solely on shaitan, he put no blame on his brothers. So in, instead of being their adversary, he became their ally. In the court of Allah, he is standing as a witness for them, not against them. 
And this is why one of our great early scholars, Al-Hakim Al-Tirmidhi, he says that futua is to be an adversary against yourself, representing Allah against yourself in this life, meaning that you're taking yourself into account in this life before you get to the court of Allah and you're questioned by Allah himself. That was the first thing he said. The second thing he said, futua is to be an intercessor for your brother before your, before your God. Meaning that you forgive that person here in this life so that Allah does not take him to trial, does not take him to account in the next life. So this is one of the essential parts of being a believer. This idea of futua, of strength, of virtue. We often talk about this as being characterized by martial strength. So when we talk about the futua of Sayyidina Ali, we focus very often on his strength and his discipline and his bravery. And that's because those are all outward manifestations of the same strength and the same discipline and the same bravery that he had over his own self. And this is one of the key aspects we have to understand about futua and about strength. The Prophet said, لَيْسَ الشَّدِيدُ بِالسُرَعَ إِنَّمَا الشَّدِيدُ الَّذِي يَمْنِكُ نَفْسَهُ عِنْدَ الْغَضَبِ the strong one is not the one that is best at wrestling, at best at grappling, that can take the other person down. But the strong one is the one that can control himself when he is angered. So we're not trying to see, we're not trying to root out anger entirely. Anger is necessary, as we've mentioned before. Anger is a necessary part of being human. And the Prophet ﷺ himself would get angry. But our goal is to control that anger, to direct that anger to the right outlets. And if we look at the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, any time that he got angry, we will not see anything that he did that we would characterize as anger. He did not yell, he did not scream, he did not throw things. He did none of these things. The only thing that happened to the Prophet ﷺ is a vein bulge on his forehead and his face turned red. And he might turn away from a person. But you will not see examples of uncontrolled rage from the Prophet ﷺ. And so this is what the hadith is telling us is true strength. True strength is the ability not to give in to that anger not to give in to that anger that's simmering in our souls. But if true strength is in controlling anger and controlling our desires, then true weakness is to give in to them, to give in to those impulses, to give in to that anger. Weakness is that when someone insults us, that we lash out at them either at the person that insulted us or at the people around us that did nothing to us. Weakness is that when we see a person who wronged us, we turn away in hatred, we can't face them, we can't talk to them. We avoid them at all costs, we don't say salam to them. That is weakness. And that is not our way. There was once an incident between Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhumah where they were in an argument, and Abu Bakr said something to make Umar upset. And so in the middle of this discussion, in the middle of this argument, Umar left. And very, very quickly after, Abu Bakr having said what he said, he started to feel guilty that Umar had felt badly about this and had left. So that very same day, the very same day of that argument, he rushed over to the house of Umar to beg his forgiveness. But Umar radiallahu anhu was still upset. So as Abu Bakr came to the door, he knocked on the door and Umar opened it. He saw Abu Bakr and he slammed the door back. Right in the face of Abu Bakr. 
So let's pause here before we continue the story and look at ourselves if we were placed in a similar situation. If we were in an argument and we thought that we were the ones that were correct and the other person left upset because we were winning that argument, then how many of us would feel guilty enough to go and ask that person that we believe is wrong for forgiveness and do that the very same day? And then having done that, how would we respond when we think, oh, I'm trying to be the bigger person and I'm trying to put an end to this, to this argument between the two of us even though I think I'm right? But then the door is slammed in your face. Many of us here, we would probably think something along the lines of, forget this guy. I, I don't want to see this. I don't want to see him again. I, I don't want to deal with him again. Like, what is this? But Abu, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu did not react in that way. He just became more worried. He becomes so worried that he's upset another Muslim. And not just any Muslim. He's not just upset any Muslim. He's, uh, he's upset someone as high in stature as Umar radiallahu anhu. In such a way that Umar is not ready to forgive him yet. And so he's thinking about this. And this worry makes him quite literally run, literally run to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He runs to the masjid to find the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so he runs in out of breath, and he sits next to the Prophet ﷺ, and he starts explaining what happened. His distress is very clear on his face. He explains, Umar and he had gotten into an argument, and now Umar anhu is not forgiving him. So what should he do? And so the Prophet ﷺ, he saw this his distress, and he started comforting Abu Bakr. And he asked, and he asked Allah to forgive Abu Bakr for his actions. And so the Prophet ﷺ was starting to get upset as well because Abu Bakr was upset. At the same time as this was all going on, Umar who was in his house and his anger had started to cool down and he started reflecting and he started feeling guilty for what he had done. How could I have refused to forgive Abu Bakr? So he ran to the home of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and no one was there. No one responded, so he began to worry even more. And so he rushed to the, to the masjid to find the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when he got there, he saw, oh, here's the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with Abu Bakr and they're both upset. And so he starts rushing to explain what happened and how he's in the wrong and he's begging the Prophet ﷺ and, and Abu Bakr for forgiveness. And here, the Prophet ﷺ, he's upset, so he starts saying some, some harsher words to Umar, reprimanding him for the way he's been acting, for letting, the, for letting his anger get the best of him. And what does Abu Bakr do when he sees this? Now he sees... Umar is getting reprimanded by the Prophet ﷺ. He's starting to get embarrassed. He feels shamed. So Abu Bakr leaps up in defense of Umar anhu. He says, what I did to him is far worse than what he did to me, so just forgive him. Let him go. And if we take the time to really reflect on this story, It teaches us really everything that we, need to, that we need to understand about anger and how to deal with anger. First, that anger is natural and it happens. And what matters is not whether necessarily we feel the anger, but what our response to feeling that anger is and how we control that anger. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he did not get angry on his own behalf. He did, he did not get angry because he thought he was right. He did not get angry because he thought he was entitled to being forgiven. The Prophet ﷺ, he didn't get angry for himself. He didn't get angry that, oh, one of my followers doesn't know what to do. 
he got angry in defense of Abu Bakr because Umar had caused him distress when Umar should not have. So he was angry in defense of his friend. And then Umar radiallahu anhu, even though he had let his initial anger cause him to act in a way that he should not have, cause him to refuse to forgive Abu Bakr, he then rushed to be forgiven for that lapse, for that error. And then Abu Bakr, as we say at the end, he rushed to, protective, to, to protect and to defend Umar radiallahu anhu. Right? That is when his anger started. Right? This is how we are supposed to use anger properly. Even if in English this is hard to call anger, it's hard to call Abu Bakr's defense of Umar at the very end, it's difficult to call that anger, but that is a function of anger. So there's no yelling, and there's no screaming, and there's no lasting enmity. Everything is resolved within a couple hours of the argument beginning. And each person by the end is rushing to the defense of the other and seeking the forgiveness of the other. This is the way of the Muslim. This is the way of the believer. This is the way of futuwa. Ours is not the way of anger. Having said this, I ask for Allah's forgiveness. الحمد لله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له والصلاة والسلام على رسوله المصطفى صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم. Praise be to Allah. We testify that there is no god but Allah alone and without partner. May prayers and peace be upon His chosen messenger. Perhaps one of the most famous and short hadiths in our tradition is when a man comes to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and he asks him for advice. We've all heard this hadith. The Prophet ﷺ responded to him and he said, La taghdab. Do not get angry. And he asked again. So the Prophet ﷺ responded again, La taghdab. Do not get angry. Each time he asked, three times, he, and the Prophet ﷺ each time said, La taghdab. Do not get angry. And so perhaps today we can leave you with no better advice than, the, than those words of the Prophet ﷺ. Do not get angry. Do not let your anger get the better of you. Forgive your brother, forgive your sister, forgive your parents, forgive your children, forgive your co-workers, forgive your classmates, whoever else in your life that may or may not have wronged you, forgive them. Control yourself. Be strong. When anger comes over you, Understand that anger is like a fire. It's a heat. So the Prophet ﷺ advised us to sit down when you get angry. Get lower, get closer to the earth. Because heat rises, fire rises. And if that's not enough, then lie down. Get even closer to the earth. That will cool you off. If that's not enough, then go make wudu as well. Because that water will cool that fire of anger. And remember that insofar as anger is a fire, that anger is meant to power you. But shaitan is trying to make sure it engulfs you. That the fire does not just burn to, to power you and to move you, but it completely destroys you. So if your anger tends towards that, that is starting to consume you, remember that that anger is probably from a place of arrogance. Because you feel that you deserve better than what you are getting. And remember, when you think of that, that arrogance is something that puts you in competition with Allah. That I think I deserve this, but God thinks I deserve this, and therefore we're in competition. And Allah tells us in a hadith that those that compete with Allah will be given, will be thrown into the fires of hell. 
But also remember, as we advise you to control anger and to not get angry, to not let your anger go so much that you disregard the dignity of your fellow Muslim and that you let others change and disfigure the religion of Allah. Because those are things that we should be getting angry for. But even in that, as we started, we must have adal and ihsan, justice and excellence. Justice is in tempering our anger to match the situation and to react only within the bounds of the sharia, the bounds which Allah has drawn for us. And excellence is by forgiving and by letting go and by giving excuses. The Prophet ﷺ said, كَمَا تَدِينُ تُدَان As you treat others, you will be treated. And so while we might very often ask for Allah's justice, what we all really want at the end of the day is Allah's mercy. And so as the Prophet ﷺ advises us, لَا تَغْضَبْ اللَّهُمَّ وَفِقْنَا لِمَا تُحِبُّهُ وَتَرْضَى we ask Allah to grace us with that which He loves and is pleased with. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma wa arda an sadatina Abi Bakr wa Umar wa Uthman wa Ali. Wa arda Allahumma an al Hassan wa an al Hussein wa an ummi ma fatiba al Zahra wa an al Sahabati ajma'in wa an azwaj nabiyika ummahat al mu'minin wa an al Tabi'ina wa Tabi'ihim bihsan ila yom al-Din wa alayna ma'ahum bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin. May Allah send prayers and peace upon our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And may He be pleased with our masters Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and, uh, Uthman and Ali, and al Hassan al Hussein, as well as their mother, Fatima al Zahra, and the rest of the companions and the mothers of the believers and those that follow them in goodness until the day of judgment. And we ask that Allah be pleased with us as well out of His vast mercy. Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min adabi jahannam, min adabi al qabr, min fitnat al mahya al mamat, min sharri fitnat al masih al dajjal. We ask that Allah give us refuge with Him from the punishment of the fire, the torment of the grave the trials of life and death, and the evil of the tribulation of the Dajjal, the Antichrist. Wabad, for in Allah Ta'ala Yaqul, in Allah Yaqmur bil Adli, will Ihsani, wa Ita idil Kurba, wa Yenhan il Fahshai, wal Munkari, wal Baghi, Yaidukum la alukum to that Karun. To conclude, Allah commands us, surely Allah commands to justice, and to excellence, and to charity to relatives. And He forbids indecency vice and injustice. He warns you so that you may take heed.